since we last saw each other, one major uh, milestone that we've done at the Center for Science Diplomacy is to launch an online course. I don't know if uh, some of you have seen it already. It was uh, circulated among the materials uh, for the course at some point. Um, and really this is, uh, you know, distilled in an hour, the fundamentals, an introductory lecture on science diplomacy. And we really hope that this is going to be useful for and, and, and reach many people around the world that cannot always make it in person uh, to our courses and, and, and trainings and seminars. So um, this uh, hopefully help, will help you um, understand a little better the concepts, but also learn how you can apply them to your work and your daily life, uh, whatever the discipline and country and sector you, you are in. So this is a little announcement. Um, and now I I'm very happy that this session is really uh, uh, the result, the product of um, a seminar, tr a training uh, workshop that we had uh, three weeks ago, is it four weeks ago now? Uh, in Washington, D.C. and uh, Jessica and Caitlin were there and uh, I'm very happy that we can all present together on this important topic. So what are the SDGs? Let's talk about this global agenda for a little bit. If we go back in time, you might remember that until 2015, the UN had set this framework, uh, this agenda called the Millennium Development Goals. How many of you are familiar with the MDGs? Okay. So this was an agenda that uh, had an expi expiration date. So by 2015, uh, the agenda was over. And did we achieve the MDGs? Anybody knows if we achieved them? Did we, did we achieve the MDGs? Conseguimos los MDGs? No. No, in absoluto. Not at all, right? So then we needed an extension. We needed something new to, to basically get more time so we can uh, accomplish this, um, this uh, sustainability agenda. So the UN, uh, all countries got together and decided on this new agenda called the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 Agenda. Very ambitious set of goals, 17 goals that was adopted um, in September 2015 um, and at a historic UN summit that you can see in the picture and came into force uh, January 1st, uh, 2016. So what is this agenda encompassing? What does it mean and why is relevant for us? So there are 17 goals, 169 targets and 232 indicators as of today. This keeps changing. Um, that doesn't sound like a very easy thing to do because the goals are very nice and very broad and we'll see them, we saw them in the beginning and they uh, really encompass vast amounts of things like life below water or life on land or peace and justice or gender equality. That is not a disciplinary issue. So none of, none of the disciplines that we can imagine can achieve any of those goals, right? So this is a changing, as a new framework to not just focus on the how, what can each sector or discipline accomplish, but how can we work together to accomplish this um, set of goals. And the innovation or the new uh, aspects of this agenda compared to the MDGs is that the MDGs were largely targeting the developing countries. The SDGs are an agenda for both developed and developing countries. So everybody is on the same boat. It's a recognition that everybody, we are all in this together. And if we don't achieve one goal, we don't achieve all. That's what we call the interlinked agenda. It's an all or nothing. And it has been designed to be all or nothing. So really to achieve one, we have to achieve 17. And that's a pretty big deal. Um, it integrates the three pillars, traditional pillars of sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental, and also the three pillars of the United Nations, development, human rights, and peace and security. Um, the interesting thing for us here is that science is not a goal. There is no goal that says, oh, we should uh, promote science, or we should use more science, we should fund science. No, science is cross-cutting. And there were some criticism because science was absent, uh, but it's really not absent, it's cross-cutting, it's everywhere, as we've seen. And um, one of the important um, 
goals of the goals <laughs> is that they have to be evidence-based. And so we're going to talk about how do we produce that evidence and how does science integrate in the goals. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, you know, the difference with other uh, treaties and conventions and, and, and multilateral instruments that we might be familiar with is that this is a non-binding, this is, this is not a binding treaty, so no one was really obligated to, to report anything annually or there is really no uh, control. No one's going to go chase you if you don't comply. It's really based on the voluntary national reports and what they call the national action plan. So basically, the point and the, the design is, is, is very deliberate, so countries can um, align their own national policies and instruments, and also international organizations as well, to the sustainable the development agenda. So it's no longer about, um, you know, signing uh, on to this treaty and then doing whatever needs to be done to comply with that treaty, like reducing emissions. This is really about how is your entire national agenda going to fit into the SDGs? And how are you going to create your national action plan that is actually the plan that you were going to do anyway if you want to uh, um, 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 engage um, renewable energies or clean water or gender equality? So those goals, you were going to hopefully have them anyway in your country. So now you have to align your goals with the sustainable development agenda. And there are many instruments and resources that allow you to, to make that connection. So basically, the SDGs are now a framework that any country can say, I'm doing this. My gender equality policy is really to comply with the SDGs. Uh, but it's not really. So it's something that hopefully you were going to do anyway. Um, but this is a way for harmonization of all policies. And the countries are starting to release the national action plans. So uh, a few months ago, Denmark and Norway released their SDG action plan, how these countries are going to adapt and adopt and, and commit to achieving the SDGs. And not only national plans, but also the multilateral organizations and regional institutions are adopting the SDG agenda. So we see the EU through the European Commission, the African Union, but also um, some funding instruments like the Green, the Green Climate Fund that we're going to uh, talk about in a minute, uh, but also the, the banks, the World Bank, the IDB, OECD, uh, the different treaties and conventions, CBD, CITES, and, and so forth. If you're interested in learning how, oops, uh, okay, I got out of the presentation. I was trying to point, and it's, uh, okay, sorry, okay, I was trying to point. If you're interested in how your country is doing, if your country has already uh, put forward a, a national action plan, uh, the, the previous one, please, thank you. Um, so you have this um, sustainable development no, um, goals knowledge platform. This website here, SDG, IISD, oh, something's going on. Okay. Anyway, that's the address. So SDG, IISD.org. You can follow and you can find your country um, if it's already provided. Some, uh, you know, there are policy briefs, there are some national strategies, you can check that. And if not, you can go to your government and say, hey, why are we not yet on board with this um, 2030 agenda? What is our country doing? And, and, and we're going to talk about this, the top-down and bottom-up approaches for that. Um, if you want, okay, I'm going to... No, no, it's okay. I'm going I'm to stop pointing. It, it's easy if I just stop. Easier. Um, view. Right? <laughs> and if you're interested in what these indicators and targets are, this uh, 169.2232, you go to the UN statistic website at the bottom, and you will see how they are going to measure. So science, the role of science, is to help measure and monitor the progress towards sustainable development goals. And when we say that they are all interconnected, 
it means that there are some, so again, if we, we can only achieve one by achieving all, but also there are some um, degrees or stages, if you will, that, um, that remind us to the, the, the three Ps of the MDGs. So peace, planet, people. Um, here we have biosphere at the bottom of the pyramid. So really, if we don't have a functioning and livable biosphere, there cannot be society, there cannot be work or jobs or equality of any sort if our planet does not support us anymore. And as you know, in many parts of the world, we are at the brink of planetary collapse and we are past our supporting uh, the, the planet's carrying capacity. So we need a functioning biosphere, then we need societal goals like economic empowerment, gender equality, and so forth. And then when we have a healthy planet and a functioning society, we can think about the economy, we can think about jobs. And um, at the top, the goal 17 is the partnerships, it means that we cannot achieve these goals uh, only government or only any sector. So this is about public, private partnerships and uh, how we are all going to work together and governance and global governance and how we are going to transform global, global governance. Um, so the role of science in achieving the, the SDGs, so we can provide the evidence, scientists can provide the evidence and tell, govern, um, tell governments how they're doing, provide indicators and, 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 and progress uh, monitoring progress and provide evidence-based policy and, and policy advice uh, of what's working and what's not. And of course, by working together and distributing us no longer in disciplines, but in this integrated goal of um, life underwater, for instance, we can find innovative solutions that we wouldn't devise in a single discipline. And one of the goals that is not obvious, but it's very important, and, and, and from my perspective, it is extremely important, is to help countries build their science, policy, society, ecosystem of governmental and non-governmental actors and have functioning science advice mechanisms and a close connection between uh, science and policy everywhere. Um, if you're interested in the science, the role of science in the SDGs, the interactions, uh, the best place to go is ICSU, the International Council for Science, is the voice of science in the United Nations. They are the major group that represents science, um, all science, so natural and social sciences. Now ICSU is merging with the International so Social Science Council, ISC, ISSC, and they're going to integrate into one science council that will encompass both natural and social sciences. And this report really guides the interaction of SDGs from science to implementation. And finally, I wanna say that this sounds very abstract and, and some because this, again, this is a non-binding agreement because no one is forcing anyone to do anything. It can sound like, well, you know, whatever. This is really, a, Opportunity, and I, I, I think we should reframe the SDGs as an opportunity because they give us a framework that we can reference every time we want funding for something, every time we want to start a project on anything. And because they are so broad, the weakness is that they are so broad, but that's also the strength. And you can always refer to the SDGs and say there is an international um, treaty and an international agreement that all countries are, uh, are uh, signatories, and you can go to your uh, government and say you this government subscribe to the SDGs. You signed that agreement, so where is your action? And you can use that to get funding for your work and collaborations and so forth. And there's, there's a top-down approach as with everything and a bottom-down uh, bottom approach. So some countries and some uh, regional organizations like the EU, as I was saying, have decided to take this at the top. So the European Commissioner for Science and Research, Carlos Moedas, he decided that the SDGs would be the top priority for the European Union in, uh, in terms of science and innovation. And he created a commission to advise him on how to go about that and how to do that. And I was very fortunate to be part of that uh, group of advisors that, um, that um, help um, shape or give some form to this strategy for the EU, how the EU as a regional organization and then 
the member states are going to achieve the SDGs from the top down. And then the scientific community is mobilizing from the bottom up to meet those goals and then to demand the government to uh, sign. Well, everybody has already signed. So really to, to, to take action and to, and to follow through. Um, before I turn it to my colleagues, if you are interested in the more practical aspects of how science and policy intersect. Um, we, another update from last year is that we released a report that maps uh, over 200 mechanisms for science policy engagement in over 50 countries. Some of those countries are your countries. These are opportunities for fellowship programs, for internship programs, for secondments, anything that you can do as a scientist to be involved in policy and vice versa. Anything that policymakers can do to get more involved in science and break or bridge uh, that divide that unfortunately exists uh, in, in, in so many of our countries uh, still. So this is a, um, the address global science policy uh, for, from the AAAS website. Um, it's all free to download. So one of the key, so we're talking about a future. We're talking about 2030. It's, it sounds like tomorrow, still some years to go, but this is an agenda that's going to go f way, way, way beyond 2030. Probably in 2028, 20, we're going to say, oh, we didn't achieve half of it, so we need an extension, and we're going to go to the agenda 2050 and so forth. So the important thing to note is that this is our job for the next generation. And what we do is we work with the next generation. We start uh, this thinking, not now at, at our age, but really from kids. So how do we uh, embed this 2030 agenda into the education system? So Kaylin and Jessica are going to present from the very little kids all the way to university, higher education and research. How are we going to uh, change the paradigm of education and research and science so we can achieve the agenda? So thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it to Kaylin. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, so I'm here to talk mostly about uh, the kindergarten through to grade 12 range of how, how SDGs fit into education. Uh, and Marga already, you did a great job of explaining why that's important. I'm gonna really hammer that home some more and tell you other reasons why you should care about this and how I think this fits with the work that we're doing here. Uh, and also go through some examples of how different countries, different education systems are working to bring SDGs to young people. Um, so I put these two pictures in just as, as a local example. Um, and you'll notice, uh, yeah, all of my examples are Canadian because um, that's my context. Uh, but I'd encourage you to, to think about how this applies in your country and, and maybe uh, at the end when we have time for questions, um, share some examples about what you're seeing. So these two photos here are from a, a small sustainability conference here in Calgary that was in June. Um, it was called SHIFT and it was all around sustainable cities and just getting people to be incredibly imaginative about what could we do to transform this city to make it more sustainable and it was so great because as soon as I walked in the front door there's there's the sustainable development goals on these you know printed out on little sheets of paper um, but this is really cool to see see communities rallying around this this cause um, and yeah why is this important well 40 percent of the global population is a 24 or younger so this is a huge population. And like Marga said, as these children grow up, they're gonna be the ones who are making the decisions, who are building the policy. These are the change makers of the future. Um, and a lot of youth are very influ influential right now. Um, high school students, uh, undergraduate students, making huge steps to influence policy and, and be part of that conversation. Um, really exciting to see younger and younger kids getting involved and being active. So. Uh, yeah, this is just one reason why I'm personally, personally in education and why I think it's important. Um, so I wanted to show just a quick video. This is a one minute video um, produced by my organization. Uh, so I'll get, you can watch it and then I'll talk about it. Changing the world to me looks like educating the world, to 
let people know that there are better ways to do things, that they can prevent certain diseases. Abundant access to water for all. I think if I could solve that, or if we could solve that, that would be amazing. To project forward it with an exact uh, idea of what we can expect with our oceans. That would be pretty interesting. Changing the world to me means creating lasting technology or innovation that changes people's lives for the better. To come up with a cure for cancer. And why? Because it affects so many people. I would like to see more diversity in the technology space. If you think about how many people use technology, that's all of us. Changing the world means that the person you are tomorrow is better than the person you are today. Okay, so this video is part of a series that we did where we went and interviewed leaders in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, to ask them about their careers, why they do the work they do, why are they passionate about their, their studies and their, and their discipline. And all of this stuff that they were coming back to, this is stuff, really inspirational sort of stuff around changing the world. And when I went into the UN to, to see what they have on their website about the sustainable development goals, you really see this inspirational language echoed as well. So if, you, if you're on social media, if you're on Twitter, uh, I'm gonna be referencing some hashtags in, this, in my presentation. So global goals is one of them uh, that you can follow. And if you look at what's there, these are, these are direct uh, phrases and words taken from various UN publications about the Sustainable Development Goals. And this is really uh, changing the world sort of stuff, you know, around building a better tomorrow. And, you know, they, they admit that they, these are ambitious goals, but they really believe that with, with this commitment, participation, really trying to get people active and participating in this, that we could change the world. And so I think especially when you're talking to kids, you know, that's the kind of stuff that's going to get them inspired, get them engaged and get them excited. And so that's the sort of language that I like to use uh, when talking about the sustainable development goals. And I think not just for young people, but for adults as well, when we're talking about why do we care? And I think probably deep down, all of us want to make, make an impact and do something that will build legacy and, and change the world. So even though um, they have these ambitious goals and maybe we'll achieve them by 2030, probably not. Uh, that was one of the things that came up in DC. It was, so, it was so refreshing to hear policymakers saying out loud, well, yeah, you know what, probably not. We're not gonna put a check mark in like A plus, like, the teacher I am, like, good job. Um, yeah, you know what, but why not? Why not try and set something really ambitious and get, you know, set that goal lofty and really, really try for it. So, and I do think that this happens with kids. If we're not talking to kids and starting the conversation young, like really young, you know, as soon as, this is when they're forming their behaviors and their habits and all of that, you, you need to start that now. So, I might have to do this on the computer. Mm. Hang on, patience. Aha, here we go. Okay, so this idea around how do we talk to kids then about sustainable development goals? And hopefully you will all start to think about, well, how will you talk to kids about the science that you're doing and the work that you're doing? Because I think all of our projects here can be linked in some way to the sustainable development goals. So these are fairly basic words, like number three, good health. Um, okay, you could talk to kids about that, but this idea, number 10, say reduced inequalities. That's a really sophisticated concept to talk to kids. So this is, this is a challenge, you know, the, how do we talk to kids about SDGs in a way that they can get it? So this is something that UNICEF has done. They're using Smurfs um, as a vehicle to explain SDGs. This is really cute. So yay, equality for all Smurfs and everyone can rally around that. And zero hunger, you've got your Smurf with an apple. Um, it's really cute. It's a cute campaign. You can go look it up. It's UNICEF. Um, and, but all different countries are trying different strategies to talk to kids about SDGs. Uh, I believe it was Sweden, they have some like 
really hot YouTube star who's like their ambassador. So I guess they're using pop culture as a way to engage youth, figuring, okay, if it's someone popular, you know, maybe the kids will listen. Um, but what I, what I really want to address is how are, how are teachers talking about SDGs? Um, what does that look like in the classroom? And there's definitely ways for all of you to connect with teachers um, and influence what's happening in the classroom. I, I'm speaking from a Canadian perspective, maybe it's different in, in other countries, but for sure in North America, um, there's so many opportunities for, for scientists and various disciplines to collaborate with education uh, to, to bring things into the classroom. So I'm gonna talk about a, just a few examples of stuff that's happening right now uh, around the world to, to bring SDGs into the classroom. So this is one of my favorite hashtags. I follow it and there's like de constant conversation on Twitter around teach SDGs. So if you search hashtag teach SDGs, uh, there's a pledge that you can sign, like a digital pledge saying, uh, it's right there. I just joined the movement to bring the global goals you can follow that account, uh, to education. You can learn about hashtag TeachSDGs at teachsdgs.org or follow it on Twitter. Um, and this is so awesome. This is building a whole community of educators who are talking about things that they're doing. So they're sharing lesson plans and they're sharing videos. They're sharing games. There's a whole game right now just to teach, a digital game to teach kids about SDGs. And, and this is really exciting. This is free stuff. Like ev every teacher loves free stuff. Um, so yeah, I th probably all of us do. Uh, but yeah, this is so, so great. And, and this, again, this is kind of world changing stuff. You're getting stories, photos, things from around the world around what our teachers doing um, and really trying to share ideas uh, around what can, what can be accomplished. Just uh, not even a month ago, in sort of mid-September, uh, the world's largest lesson was launched. Um, and this is an idea that you could get children from around the world participating in what, uh, what they're calling the world's largest lesson. And they're focusing specifically on these three, three concepts here, uh, to end extreme poverty, fight inequality and injustice, and tackle climate change and really approaching this through a cross-cutting lens. So yeah, the science plays a big part in this, for sure, but this is something that transcends subjects. Um, you can't just sit in a science classroom and talk, talk about tackling climate change. This has a place in social studies curriculum. For us here, that's you know around society and culture. This is communication. How do you how do you talk to people and educate people about climate change? Uh, this is really really important. So, this is another thing too that you can look at the world's largest lesson, um, and and you can hear stories about what's happening um, with that. This is another initiative. Um, that is really exciting to see. They're trying to, to get as many youth ambassadors as possible to become advocates for the SDGs in their own local community. So uh, September 30th, like a couple days before you guys arrived, um, here on campus, they had a big training session to teach young people about the SDGs so that they could go and teach other young people about SDGs, which is really awesome because sadly, most young people wanna hear from teenagers, like teenagers will listen to their friends before they'll listen to a parent or a teacher more often than not. So really this is empowering youth to be those change makers. So I, pro I can show you really quickly. It's like one, another one minute. So you can hear from this student. He's uh, a Canadian, I believe he's Calgarian uh, ambassador for. So you do it on I'm the Executive Director of Foundation for Environmental Stewardship. In celebration of Canada 150, we're hosting 50 SDG trainings across the country uh, in universities and colleges and post-secondary institutions. Please welcome Austin. Ça s'appelle Leader d'impact en responsabilité active. 
invite anybody who has questions to contribute to the plus d'empowerment de l'État, ça permet plus de respect des droits de l'homme. Help the transgender community in third world countries. No implementation of how to be part of it. It's still the biggest question. We can have a holistic, inclusive, sustainable, and equitable future. Thank you very much. What I liked most about this was that this was an, an, an initiative to connect youth with uh, education as well as with policymakers. So in all of these training sessions, they they have also people from government uh, who are present, and it's it's starting to bridge that uh, bridge that gap between science and policy that can sometimes exist. Um, and so this brings me to the next point: is around this idea around education and science diplomacy, and how do they connect? Uh, do they even can are, do they share that space? This is something that I was thinking a lot about when I attended the AAAS training. Thinking, okay, here I am, a classroom teacher. When does a teacher ever say the word science diplomacy in a classroom? It doesn't. It does not happen. Um, but yeah, this is this. It, it will and it is. I think it's starting to happen. And yet, like just in that last example with this youth training. This is a chance for education, science, diplomacy, uh, all to start to have this common language and this common conversation. Uh, so the example that I wanted to give here is this idea around where do SDGs reside in curriculum around the world. And there are some countries already, Germany is one of them, uh, that are starting to integrate SDGs into the standards that are their common and uh, common expectations in the classroom uh, and what that looks like. Here in Alberta, we're in the process of curriculum redesign right now. Um, so for kindergarten through to grade 12, every subject is getting revisited um, and every grade around what are those standards and what do we want kids learning in the classroom. And one of the things that our Minister of Education has put out are these competencies and these are across all grades all subjects. This is not the SDGs, but when you look at this at this language, this is such a great opportunity here in this province to create space for talking about SDGs. So in my work, I'm starting to incorporate it into uh, project-based learning opportunities, into design thinking challenges. Is you know, if you want to teach kids about cultural and global citizenship and collaboration and maybe some critical thinking, just as examples. Why not use the SDGs as an example of meeting those competencies? Uh, so yeah, I really do see that education and science and diplomacy have, have a place. And one of the things that Marga mentioned uh, to me as an aside was this idea that SDGs, uh, when we're looking at it, this is not, uh, not policy for science, but science that has the potential to, to influence policy. And, and we see that being developed. Uh, and I know, uh, Don, you spoke about stakeholders and that, that word, st stakeholder engagement, but I'm going to throw in some, some, that buzzword there. Uh, stakeholder engagement, we could do that. Um, but yeah, this is, this is such a great opportunity. Uh, so yeah, I would encourage you to think about what's happening in your community, uh, in your country maybe. Uh, how could you maybe collaborate and bring some of that science work that has the potential to, to work towards the SDGs uh, into education. And finally, why you should care. So you say, great, why, why would I do that? Uh, very quickly, here's, I get three reasons off the top of my head why you could care. There's money in this. Uh, lots of countries see an opportunity for work that will further the SDGs or bring us closer to achieving them. Uh, SDG Labs, the, our Grasslands group, we found this funding opportunity. So if you want to hear more about SDG Labs and what that is, are they still, do they have still more money? I don't know. Gabrielle was in charge of that one. But there's other, there's other opportunities. This is something that is of interest. So think about maybe opportunities for funding. Definitely opportunities for transdisciplinary work. For sure, for sure, because this is such an important cross-cutting 
goal, set of goals, uh, this is something that we all need to come together on and collaborate on. So if you like transdisciplinary work, hopefully you do, because you're here, you can, you can do more of that. And finally, yeah, this idea, this uh, changing the world. Wouldn't it be so great if we all worked together and we actually achieved the 2030 agenda by 2030. Um, so if you're into that inspirational sort of stuff, uh, yeah, I definitely think why, why would you care is because you want to be part of changing the world. So I am going to turn it over to Jessica now to talk about post-secondary. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you for the organizers and the amazing opportunity to be here and share with you some thoughts that have been emerging since the meeting in Washington, uh, where we were learning about science diplomacy and how can that be related with our work. And also thank you, Marga and Caitlin for that amazing introduction. I, I just would like to share with you some um, ideas. In Washington, we had the opportunity to talk with Ernesto Fernandez, the chief of the Division of Science in UNESCO, and he, uh, he did a great presentation about uh, science, in, how science in the uh, has, w was involved in the development of the SDG goals and the agenda of 2030, how science can improve uh, or how can help to achieve the SDG goals and the agenda for 2030. And, the, and what is the agenda 2030 and SDG uh, goals doing uh, for science? And when we say science, uh, we are, uh, we are talking about all uh, natural science, social science, humanities, science, technology, and engineering, and, uh, uh, and knowledge, all of type of knowledge, scientific knowledge, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, other sources of knowledge. So uh, this agenda is, uh, is not only uh, it sets uh, broad goals, but also is inclusive. So in this framework, uh, well, uh, how, how uh, advancing, how, uh, how uh, the SDG goals could have progress with science. In this point, universities have a critical role, in, uh, not only equipping the next generation of leaders with the skills, and they need to be innovators and decision makers, but also providing research and technical expertise for developing practical solutions to meet the SDG goals, and demonstrating leadership by promoting the SDG goals through their own operations. But however, I, today I would like to, to uh, ask you to think about how, how science can progress through the SDG framework. Let's, let's try to, to, to think about what will be the benefit for the universities to be involved or to work with the SDG frameworks. Some uh, uh, ideas that maybe that comes already to your mind is a new way to communicate the university to uh, contribution to local and global issues. Huh? It's also a transforming experience. Uh, in my particular case, uh, I am a teacher, a professor at the Universidad de las Fuerzas Armadas de ESPE. Uh, ESPE did use the SKOS UNESCO nomenclature for fields and science and technology to build their uh, agen agenda for research and areas of, and disciplines of work. And this, uh, this statement was made during the 70s where the areas are monodisciplinary and some of them multidisciplinary. So think about uh, what about if we use the SDG framework as an umbrella to uh, frame the areas of work. Then we will have to jump from monodisciplinary or multidisciplinary to transdisciplinary. And that uh, is um, a challenge, and I think it's an interesting challenge to that I would like to invite you later to join. Another benefit is that it will foster synergistic part partnerships between the academia, development organization, governments, private community, civil society. As a university, we usually uh, set the agendas from 
our professional perspective. This is what we know how to do. This is what, uh, these are our expertise. However, if we think about the SDG goals, we are also thinking uh, in the impact in our society, in, and we are thinking of the stakeholders as our partners. So we will also have to uh, foster synergistic partnership and establish uh, common goals. Okay, so uh, from vision to action, you know, uh, how can we achieve this? How can we make SDG goals a framework in our uh, academic institutions? I would like to show you two emerging approaches approach that I have learned recently. The first one is mapping university contributions to the sustainable development goals, and the second one, integrating SDG goals into the research agendas. So how universities already contribute with the SDG goals? Uh, that's, uh, this question should, uh, could be answered by mapping university contributions to uh, the SDG goals. Um, uh, we can learn from the experience of Sustainable Development Solution Network from the Australia Pacific, um, Australian and Pacific not. Uh, they, they uh, together with the Australian campuses towards sustainability, did uh, a, a, some exercises trying to uh, map how the, their institutions, academic institutions, are contributing to the SDG goals. They took many approaches from um, anal a network analysis where they did ask the scientists to um, to uh, uh, send five keywords from their work, and they did a network analysis con with keywords of the uh, SDG agenda. There are other uh, complex methods that have been used. Today, I would like to show you one method um, from the Institute for Sustainable Future, University of Technology in Sydney where they did use a collaborative, a collaborative approach. What they did is they uh, created a matrix. In the matrix, they put the goal and the targets, and they ask not only the scientists, but they ask also the, uh, the partnerships and the strate their strategic partnerships to, uh, to mark an X uh, where their project fits into the target. So uh, they were a little bit more specific. They did not only, uh, they did not only focus on the goal, general goal, but they did focus in the target that is under the goal. And with the, the results, they did some analysis, and they, they did present uh, the results in a graphic way, where you can see each goal in a different color and uh, you can see the research areas, and where the color is bold is where the area of the, the institution is matching their goal. So this is one way to visually see uh, how the institution is uh, supporting or contributing to the SDG goals. So this is uh, one, uh, I, this is the first step that the, some academic institutions um, have been uh, taking to see how they are, the, how their efforts are uh, contributing to the SDG goals. What are the benefits of this exercise? Well, first of all, the alignment with the global standards, identifying strengths, gaps, and opportunities. Also, uh, it helped the academic institution for the communication and promotion of the university, not only in the local, but in the global uh, level. The results uh, are still in discussion, so it has raised a, a dialogue between researchers from different disciplines and with uh, stakeholders. And, and this, uh, this results also, this report is information based for uh, promote collaboration between researchers and the stakeholders for understanding the integration of different academic activities such as teaching, research, uh, uh, administration. 
It's also a tool for engagement with capacity building with the, for the staff, the students, and the stakeholders, and a potential benchmarking for monitoring progress. Okay. So the second approach is integrating the SDG goals into the research agenda. As a researchers, uh, we have been engaged in many exercises where we uh, identify gaps of knowledge, research priorities, and this agenda usually leads to action plans. But usually the research agendas are monodisciplinary or multidisciplinary. Um, the challenge now is to, uh, to make an agenda, a transdisciplinary agenda, to meet the SDG goals. And here is an, here is an example of an, um, of an agenda recently. This is the Agenda for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And uh, the, we all, we all uh, the agendas all are also constructed thinking in what will be our contribution to the society. Yep. So this is uh, one step, but we can do uh, a step forward trying to establish uh, the research priorities. Another exercise that I would like to share is an exercise where I was uh, uh, involved uh, setting the research priorities agenda for the Galapagos Island Archipelago. This was a call made by the Consejo de Gobierno de Galapagos. And um, we use a collar collaborative method to identify research priorities and emerging issues in science and policy. And uh, this method was developed by Doc, uh, Schutterland, Dr. Schutterland, that is in the picture right there. So how does it work? Uh, scientists and stakeholders were asked to send a question. What is the uh, what a set of questions that they think they are the most important questions to solve uh, at the archipelago? So the, these questions were uh, received and filtered through a group of experts and they uh, put the questions together in a new set of questions. And this new set of questions was, uh, was sent by, uh, was sent by, a, uh, by a, a web platform asking for uh, votes. So it was about uh, 1,000 questions. And all of the public, not only scientists, but also stakeholders, had to vote to choose the 500 questions that should be uh, answered to achieve sustainability in the islands. So after this was done, uh, we met. We met in Galapagos, as we see in the picture there. The questions were grouped by areas, by big research areas like marine questions, soil questions, plant invasion questions. So. Uh, and in each area, stakeholders and researchers were engaged to discuss these questions and to do a bold process to, uh, to achieve the 100 questions. Once the 100 questions were achieved, uh, we meet together, all of the audience was to, uh, together to do a new vote, and then we selected the 50 relevant, the 50 most relevant uh, research questions that should be addressed in order to achieve sustainability at the islands. So this was an uh, in interesting um, uh, exercise that we did in the island with the stakeholders. This was done in November uh, last year, so the results are still in discussion. Um, uh, who, however, um, I think each methodology can be uh, improved or transformed, thinking also in the uh, local, in the local perspective. Each institution or each community has their own features or own, um, their own characteristics. So you can uh, apply some tools from the SDG goals, from transdisciplinary science, from science diplomacy, to um, to create um, a, a local methodology for uh, your academic institution. 
So this is the challenge. Uh, I have been thinking how we can build a research uh, agenda by applying the transdisciplinary principles and the SDG framework. So in, in the previous meeting, we learned about the transdisciplinary principles uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was published in Lang paper. And we learned that there are three phases, the phase uh, a, where social practice or scientific practice comes together that, uh, join, that jointly describe the problem, the research problem. And then in phase B, there is a co-creation of solution, and phase C, an integration of applications of the creative knowledge. And in all of these phases, we see the social practice and scientific practice working together. So if we integrate the SDG frameworks, we can use the SDG goals to, estab to establish the umbrella, to establish the, the goal, the unifying goal that uh, we would like to achieve, what put us all together, scientists, the stakeholders. And using, that, uh, using the goals as a common, as a common fr uh, framework, then we can uh, we can, oops, sorry. <laughs> yep, this is the point. Yep, thank you, thank you. All right, so, okay, so is the SDG goals will be the, the common goal, instead of using the areas of knowledge, like ecology, let's, do, let's join all of the ecology to do the agenda. Let's use the goal number one, and then we put all, all, all of the scientists and stakeholders together to develop the agenda and also to develop an action plan. And we can use the targets and the indicators of the agenda as a tool to develop this action plan and plan for monitoring locally. So uh, this is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. So it's an opportunity for building capacity in transdisciplinary research. It's an opportunity for making changes, institutional changes to support transdisciplinary research and achieve sustainable goals. Also opportunity to create regional platforms. Uh, for instance, the IAA, that is uh, a platform, a regional platform uh, for transdisciplinary work. It's an opportunity to, for this, uh, diplomacy for science uh, having a common goal, a global goal, will increase the opportunities to bring uh, scientists from other nations that are working uh, towards a common goal. Um, it's also it will increase the opportunities of sustainability for science. As Marga said, uh, this, is, uh, this agenda uh, is is that has a time framework that is 2030, but that will be the next point for the next agenda. So working with the SDG goals, it will also give us, a, as a scientist, opportunity to have sustainability of science. So call for action. Uh, these ideas are going to be tested in my institution. We are going to do an exercise of the research agenda and the creation of the action plan for ESPE. And I, will, I am looking forward to hear about your, your thoughts about it. And if you would like to join, the, to join, join this adventure, I would love to have you in Ecuador. Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have any time for a quick question or two? Let's put back the yeah. one. One, two. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very nice. It was very interesting to, s to see the SDGs being discussed in a, in, a, in a workshop like this because it's such an important issue. 
Uh, I think that my, my question is more for, for Marga, because you said during your presentation that the approach of SDGs, SDGs is to uh, attend all of, all of them like once, so you have to attend the 17 SDGs. But I just came from, from uh, uh, a meeting in South Africa that was the discussion of the general assessment of IPBS. Mm -hmm. And well, one of the most important discussions that we had there, it was the trade-offs between the SDGs, so, so between the 17, because attending fully one of them could undermine the capacity of ad attending other of, of, the, of the SDGs. So the question is, it's more a comment than a question because it's something that, it, it, but I think that's important for us to realize that one of the challenges that us as a policymakers uh, or as a scientist is exactly to deal with these trade-offs and, and understanding that and how much you're going to attend each one and what are the consequences for the other, uh, other factors that can be involved on that. So I don't know if you have any information about any development that you can, can make about it, but I think that's important issue to be, to be uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. today. Thank you for that comment. Really, uh, I think about this a lot because since this is a non-binding um, treaty and there is no specific financial instrument dedicated to it, uh, the incentives for these trade-offs are, are a little more blurry, right? And uh, normally, if you had a, a financing instrument, uh, like uh, the Green Climate Fund or some price that you know countries get if they comply then it's easier to make the case and always you know money drives a lot of the consensus and compromise but here in, you know there is really no negotiation process in a formal way so what are the incentives for a group to promote their uh, you know goal and knowing that it undermines the others and how the other group so it, this is a very interesting exercise how are they going to negotiate in a more soft way or how can we put the incentives in place so every group understands uh, you know that pushing an agenda will maybe undermine somebody else's agenda and then the power dynamics and who's going to have you know the final say and then you know the 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 the, the, in the um, dynamics of the north south that is all going to, to play a role. So really, I, I, I'm fascinated by the question and, and uh, I, I look forward to see it play out. And there is space, I think, for contribution uh, because it's now shaping up. So I think really we can do, uh, we can play a role in, in, in that and in ensuring fair and just uh, distribution of, of the, the outcomes, if, if that is possible. Virginia. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, the three of us, for the presentation. Uh, I will pick up on Gabriel's comment and just to to uh, yeah elaborate a little, bit, a little bit more. So it's up to each country to prioritize uh, which objectives and which targets uh, it's going to yeah to fulfill or to um, yeah make most m uh, more of the efforts. And. Uh, for for every organization, private, public, a university, to be able to, uh, it's it's key to be able to demonstrate how you can contribute, how you are contributing to these uh, SDGs. But I, I just want to highlight that the only way, the only really effective way of making this contribution clear, is through in the clear indicators that match the specific targets of each goal. So it's, you cannot just make a really colorful graph saying I'm contributing to 17 or 15 of 17 goals because that's that's it's really I mean someone could do it some organization could actually been doing that but uh, you have to be able to demonstrate that with cl really robust indicators that match the exact targets in those cases that has numeric or yeah targets um, and that's a, that's really a, and, and you know now in now which countries uh, already has presented their first reports of of advance really poor reports of, of advance I should say and they are lacking uh, of indicators so how you really map your contribution in it for each target I think that's a, a really interesting gap to cover from every organization. There are a couple of uh, interesting tools, um, like uh, like the Compass and uh, I would say the, the Stockholm Institute tool is a very good one to map these interactions that Gabriel was telling about. So how uh, the effort that you put in one SDGs is affecting 
or actually benefit benefiting the other SDGs, and you can end up with a really robust map of interactions between uh, yeah and linkages between the SDGs, and this has been I don't know Mexico has done this exercise, but a, a few countries have made that that kind of really robust exercise on how to move forward the 2030 agenda. I think we have to push that kind of. Bah, more, more, yeah, more right. hard uh, thinking <laughs> uh, exercises. More than saying, because for example, Argentina is almost contributing to saving the world bec uh, based right. on their reports, and that's that's not true. Exactly, uh, a, a reality check. I think that's a very important point. And those of you working in government or, or really influencing government, should think about asking. So, for instance, Spain last week started the first national commission for the SDGs, right? So, what, what, who is in charge? And if it's just a you know a commission made of all ministries, uh, you know meeting once a year or once I don't know, is there somebody dedicated to to monitoring or is it you know, sort of an ad hoc group that comes together every once in a while and then everybody goes back to their day job? So what is it? And maybe Jen can can speak to that. So, oh. um, y Jorge, Gabi, Jen, y Jorge. So uh, thank you no for <laughs> thank you for your presentation. Gracias, a este, de Jessica, Marga, and Caitlin. So yeah, maybe in the same vein, but also thinking about education as and how this is taken up. I think it's it's important and it will be interesting. It's very similar to see it a critical way, saying well, what are that's also in terms of how we are speaking about these goals, which are very difficult and intersect with so many other social justice issues happening in the school and looking for diversity and how do we move forward in terms of these things and and often SDGs sustainable development sustainability is taught in schools um, and these social justice as aspects are often tuned out so I think that the possibility of having them being a priority or having people speaking a lot about their importance, it's a good chance to actually speak about issues of controversy and social justice to, as a way to address them in school. Yeah, thanks Gabby. If you notice, one of the criticisms is that there is no racial justice in the SDGs anywhere. So that's one of the big criticisms. So everybody wants to have many more, uh, you know, um, represent, you know, goal. So we can't have like, you know, 100 goals. So if we can only have 17, mm -hmm. what is included? And then we have, for example, gender, but we don't have race. So th those are conversations that are ongoing um, right now. Okay. Yeah. Sí. Eh, solamente para eh, comentarios de, para completar lo que estaba diciendo Virginia y Gabriel. En el caso de República Dominicana, nosotros damos, criamos lo que fue una comisión interinstitucional para los eh, seguimientos de desarrollo sostenible y el quien lo coordina es el Ministerio de Economía, Planificación y Desarrollo. Entonces, ahí mismo, esa comisión de alto nivel, dirigido por ministros, a lo más alto, se dividió en una comisión técnica. Entonces, cada comisión técnica fue la de personas, planeta, prosperidad y institucional. Y lo estamos trabajando aquí. Lo, algo que dijo Virginia fue claro, clave, los indicadores. Señores, tenemos una seria, seria deficiencia de indicadores. Y increíblemente el que menos, o sea, menos indicadores confortables que tiene es el de Planeta. O sea, Planeta está sumamente eh, eh, débil y eso es algo que incluso, que es lo que estamos hablando desde de un principio. Si dejas a un solo objetivo de desarrollo sostenible afuera, los otros se te caen obligado. Entonces, es algo que también internamente en República Dominicana estamos luchando y es el tema que acaba de mencionar Marga. O sea, tienes a gender como un objetivo, tienes el clima como otro. O sea, lo estamos viendo separados en vez de verlo unidos. Entonces, eso todavía internamente hay conflictos y hay problemas. O sea, no es algo que tenemos un plan. Sí, estamos elaborando y estamos, y estamos en, en un proceso de, de avance. Pero no, o sea, todo eternamente no sabemos cómo es que vamos a, cómo es que vamos a poder lograr eh, alcanzar esos objetivos. 
Yeah. Exactamente, ahora las intersecciones que se ven, por ejemplo, what about gender and climate, what about water and climate, todo eso ya llega, o sea, las dimensiones son infinitas, ¿no? que, las, que se pueden empezar a hacer clustering en muchas formas y eso todavía hay que explorarlo, pero es verdad, construir national capacity, institutional building and capacity to monitor and measure, it's extremely important. Jorge. Bueno, primero, gracias por la presentación, me parece un tema muy interesante. Eh, pero me falta un, un, una patita, como decimos nosotros. Eh, están los tomadores de decisión, la ciencia, etcétera, pero ¿dónde están las empresas? ¿Cómo los eh, tomadores de decisión logran vincular la acción de las empresas en el cumplimiento de estos objetivos de desarrollo sustentable? Nosotros hemos hecho una publicación ahora en julio de este año donde hicimos un análisis de los reportes de sustentabilidad de la principal empresa minera a nivel mundial en litio. ¿Ya? Eh, y entonces revisamos históricamente los reportes de sustentabilidad y cómo se relacionan al objetivo de desarrollo, al cumplimiento del objetivo uh -huh. de desarrollo del minero. Y la distancia es sideral. Es decir, todos los reportes de sustentabilidad, los reportes de sustentabilidad de las empresas son reportes que llegan a los inversores ¿ya? para tomar decisiones. ¿no? Bueno, hay una distancia sideral, es decir, eh, en, en, hay comunidades que requieren eh, condiciones de potabilidad de ala, del agua y la empresa compra bicicletas. ¿ya? Estoy, estoy haciendo una caricatura, pero creo que es, es central, es central en, el, en, el, en, el, en el análisis porque los tomadores de decisión, si no observan, no observan la participación de las empresas y cómo ellos se comportan en el territorio, esto va a ser imposible, como mucho más de los otros de los objetivos de Naciones Unidas, para lograr. Porque, porque eh, en, en, en América Latina, uno de los problemas que tenemos es que tenemos gobiernos débiles, con baja nivel de inversión, donde empresas como estas tienen, en Chile, por ejemplo, estas empresas tienen el 30% del PIB. <ríe> Entonces, si ellos no están enfocados en el cumplimiento, a través de la responsabilidad social empresarial, o como le llamen, eh, Esto va a ser muy difícil de alcanzar. Gracias, Jorge. And really, the, this is extremely important because, as you see, only Goal 17 reflects these public-private partnerships, and and you know it is it should be everywhere from sustainable cities to responsible consumption, but the focus is on the uh, partnerships on Goal 17. So how do we mainstream that into all the goals? We have so many questions. We could have an entire workshop on, on that. But I think we have to stop. So thank you for, for your questions and, and comments. Thank you.